feelings. And despite the company admitting it hired people to did little or no work at Madigan's behest, or at the very least at the suggestion of an intermediary, Madigan writes, the DPA does not attribute any misconduct to me. It asserts that certain individuals at ComEd hired individuals I purportedly recommended in an attempt to influence me, but let me be clear, that attempt was never made known to me. If it had been, it would have been profoundly unwelcome. That came up during the hearing. ComEd acknowledges repeatedly through the agreement that it um, believed or it intended to influence the speaker um, through its conduct. Um, whether it in fact influenced the speaker, whether the speaker was aware of its intent to influence, those are, those are questions that, that I don't think I'm in a position to comment on. Okay. But Durkin says it's unfathomable to think that the speaker was clueless. You know, Michael Madigan, he is not ignorant of what is going on around him. He is not naive. Now, as of showtime, literally going into 7 p.m., the committee was still going, fighting over whether to issue subpoenas to witnesses, including Madigan. Democrats' questions also seem to indicate the direction they may be going with all of this, turning the tables on the accuser, making him the accused. So you would say it was aimed to all legislators, including Leader Durkin? I, I wouldn't use the word aimed, okay. um, but I, I would say that, that ComEd attempts to engage with legislators kind of across the political spectrum. Democrats making the point that Durkin, too, they say, has made hiring recommendations to ComEd, and they indicated that they plan to call him as a witness. Now, Republicans say that Madigan, well, he's the only elected official, public official, A, in fact, who is referenced in that deferred prosecution agreement by ComEd. Brandis, back to you. Amanda, thank you. And now to Phil Ponce in a preview of tonight's highly anticipated debate. Phil. Brandis, a pandemic, a racial justice movement, and a rush to confirm a new Supreme Court justice. All this comes during an election year, and with these issues front and center, Donald Trump and Joe Biden face off tonight in the first of three presidential debates. Joining us to share what they'll be watching for tonight are Ed Lee. He's senior director of the Alvin W. Barkley Forum for Debate, Deliberation, and Dialogue at Emory University, Atlanta and Mari Mossing-Will, principal at Mossing Communications. She has prepared Republican presidential, Senate, congressional, and gubernatorial candidates for debates. She also worked with President Ronald Reagan, and she comes to us from Washington, D.C. Thank you both for joining us. First of all, Ed Lee, what, uh, what do you think Joe Biden's strategy will be tonight? What are you looking for? I, I think that Joe Biden is is set up to have a, a really good night. One of the things that I'm looking for is to show up with a good bit of energy that someone who is excited about being there counters the narrative that, that he's sleepy and can't stay awake and that the ability to just enjoy the moment and exude a presence that that he is quite presidential and ready for the moment and excited to be on stage with our current president. And Mari Will, what do you expect uh, the president's strategy to be? Well, I expect him to try to be on the offensive as much as possible. And I expect him to also enjoy the experience. He's a TV guy or thinks of himself as a TV guy. I totally agree with Ed. And whenever I'm coaching people, I tell them at the beginning that this is going to be fun. It's a game. It's going to be fun. They never believe me, but then when they finally get on stage and they are prepared, they do have a good time. And the and the audience, which is the audience watching on television, not in the hall, the audience will pick up on that. So you'll see it in body language. You'll see it in tone. You'll see it in facial expressions. And uh, I expect he's going to do that. I think both of these debaters are very good at that and very good at being on the offensive. Uh, Ed Lee, uh, most people don't think of fun when they think of, uh, of uh, debates, certainly at this level. What are the potential pitfalls for the two candidates? I think that one of the pitfalls for President Trump is something that Mari Wills alluded to, was that he gets a tremendous amount of energy out of the crowd, that he's a TV guy, he's an entertainer. 
and the ability for him to show up in a sparse audience and maintain a level of energy and be able to pretend as if there is a crowd and that he is not bored, that he doesn't look like he's lethargic or stressed. I think that that's a significant downside risk, that President Trump is brilliant at understanding what the audience needs at that particular moment and adjusting to that. The lack of a crowd is something that I hope that his campaign advisors are prepping him to deal with of not having that call and response relationship that he that that he's used to having with the audiences that show up for his rallies and other events. Because the downside he, risk. Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I was going to I was going to clarify that uh, uh, under the debate rules, only 75 people will be. Uh, attending will be in, in physical uh, presence. Uh, uh, Mari Will, uh, what do you expect or what do you think the downsides or the pitfalls might be for uh, uh, either of the candidates? And then I'll get back to you, Ed. Well, um, I think the biggest handicap for the vice, former vice president is that he hasn't been campaigning the way Trump has been campaigning. And everyone I've ever worked for has gotten better at uh, campaigning and therefore better at the debates the farther along they get into it. You get on a roll, you get your momentum, you you have certain things that you're used to saying over and over again, the, the muscle memory in your mouth. And he hasn't done that. Um, I know that he has been prepping in a very professional manner and that when he takes debating seriously, for example, he schooled me on debate with his debate with uh, Paul Ryan. He, was, he hit it out of the park. He was terrific and he maintained control almost the entire time. But that was not in a pandemic year. That was not in a, that was not in this polarized year. So um, uh, I think uh, there was- Mar Mari Singh, uh, Mari Will, I'm sorry, I missed it. To whom were you referring when, just now when you said uh, that he schooled you? Uh, Joe Biden. Oh. He was incredibly impressed. I don't know if Ed agrees, but he was, that, that debate was, uh, a work of art. Okay, Ed Lee, I interrupted you. You were about to make another point. What was that? No, I, I agree with Mari on the, the Paul Ryan, Joe Biden debate. If you have a chance to go and revisit that, one of the things that he did very well was that he was in the moment. It mm -hmm. felt like he was part of a conversation with Paul Ryan. And one of the fears that I have about Joe Biden at this moment is that he has spent a significant amount of time preparing for the debate instead of preparing to have a spontaneous and impromptu conversation with Chris Wallace and the audience. I would fear if I was the campaign that he is too programmed at the moment because what, what Mari has identified is the value of developing that muscle memory. And I share her concerns of whether or not that's something Joe Biden has been able to develop with the lack of campaigning in the traditional sense. Well, the conversation will focus on six topics, we're told, Trump and Biden's records, the Supreme Court, COVID-19, the economy, race and violence in the U.S. cities, and the integrity of the election. Mari Will, does this agenda favor one candidate over the other? I was looking at it today and I was thinking it, it might favor Trump uh, because if he can point to his economic record, which was incredible, one of the best economies we've ever had until the pandemic, and, uh, and try to turn that into hope for America in the future. It, uh, voters don't really care about what you did for them yesterday. They care about what you're going to do for me tomorrow. And if he can leverage that into being best able to bring us back into a vibrant economy on the one hand and knock the legs out, of, out from under uh, Biden by painting him as someone who's going to pile on strangling regulations and taxes and economic programs that uh, led to one of the one of the, some of the difficulties that we had during the Obama years pulling up out of the recession. Um, I think that will be a big victory for him. That is, that's what uh, Republican voters are looking for, but most importantly, that's what the swing voters who might support a Republican in this, that's what they're looking for. I, I think Biden's gonna focus on the coronavirus. He thinks that's a big plus, but from the polls that I look at, most Americans do not put that at the top of their um, issue list. Most Democrats do, and I think the worry for Biden on this issue uh, list is that 
he'll continue speaking to his party rather to those swing voters that he can keep from going back to Trump. And uh, I'm afraid we're out of time. Wish we could continue this conversation a little longer. Thank you both. We very much appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And now, Brandis, we go back to you. Phil, thank you. Last night, WTTW News Director and host of Latino Voices, Ugo Balta, held a community conversation with Latino leaders from Chicago's art, health, and business communities. Among other topics, the guests shared what they hope to hear from the presidential candidates tonight. Here's a clip from the conversation. Really looking forward to hearing them speak about an actual plan of what they have for the next four years. Um, and I think I'm expecting both candidates to bring something to the table to that uh, as opposed to just speaking in general terms and saying after the election, this is what's going to happen. But putting a little bit about, you know, you know, the outline of their plan ahead of time. We want to hear about what's, what's, what's in it for the arts on a national scale. What are we doing? A national endowment for the arts has been cut for the last four years. We need to show what the plan is for saving the arts in our, in our country because that's going to affect the Latino community. But more importantly, uh, Ugo, is uh, I think that the, the question should be, what are we doing to get out the vote? We as a, as a community need to be mobilized because otherwise all of, all of everything that we're talking about here is, is, is going to the wayside. And you can watch Chicago Tonight Latino Voices on Saturdays at 6 p.m. And on Sundays, you can watch Chicago Tonight Black Voices also at 6 p.m. And now to Paris and Chicago Alderman on the city's budget, Paris. Brandon, Chicago's looking at a lot of red ink due to COVID-related shutdowns. The budget shortfall is predicted to be $2 billion for this fiscal year and the next. Perhaps to spur part of the city's economic activity, Mayor Lori Lightfoot announced relaxed restrictions for Chicago businesses this week. Today we're coming together to announce that our city has made sufficient progress in the fight against COVID-19 to ease some of the restrictions on our businesses and give them more ability to grow and to earn revenue as we start to head into the winter months. The city's new rules taking effect Thursday boost indoor capacity to 40% for certain businesses. But what kinds of cuts might the city soon see to keep its financials afloat? Joining us are four guests who will likely have a say in those decisions. 36th Ward Alderman Gilbert Villegas, 9th Ward Alderman Anthony Beal, 38th Ward Alderman Nick Sposato, and 33rd Ward Alderman Rosana Rodriguez Sanchez. Welcome all of you. I want to get right to it. Uh, Gilbert Villegas, $2 billion in combined budget shortfalls this year and next year how will the city even begin to fill that that is that's a huge huge number huge undertaking i know that right now um that's something that we're working on through the budget different types of things different types of scenarios um there's a lot of a lot of things reliant on what occurs uh, as it relates to the fair tax what happens in november what happens in, in springfield you're I mean, saying if the fair tax a, a goes through the, the city might get a, a larger portion of money from the state well, I, I think as we're as we're advocating um, as as the fair tax is being uh, advocated for right now, I think that the city of Chicago needs to make sure that we're also advocating for the LGDF, which is our fair share of the state income tax. Uh, we in 2011 we enjoyed 10 percent, and since then it's gone down to six. And I think that since the majority of the folks uh, that are going to be end up paying the fair tax that come from Chicago, we need to make sure that we're getting back to that 2011 number of 10 percent so that, that that in itself would be anywhere between 150 to 200 million to be clear uh, that's on that's top uh, of the that, that's the money the that's the share of tax. money that comes from springfield that goes to municipalities like chicago uh, alderman rosana rodriguez sanchez uh, a few things the mayor's team has taken off the table right now a la salle street tax uh, tapping into 900 million dollars in a rainy day fund pension obligation fund uh, would city council consider uh, perhaps uh, over overturning the mayor on some of those things? Uh, that is a great question, and that is something that we're going to have to see. Um, I think that there's a lot of organizing and conversations that still are happening uh, among city council members. Um, I think that all of us also have ideas of things that we could be doing right now. One Can you give us, give us an example? So one thing that I believe that we haven't discussed enough is making sure that we're putting pressure on the Federal Reserve to issue zero interest loans. Um, I think we are in a dire situation right now and the Federal Reserve needs to step up 
uh, but I haven't seen a concrete push to demand that as a city council and unite with other localities, right? So I think that is something that we definitely need to be doing right now. Uh, Alderman Anthony Beal, uh, you know, a certain source of revenue is property taxes. Are you willing to commit here to, uh, to a vote to hike property taxes uh, should uh, there be no other way to solve this shortfall? Well, I'm not committing to anything at this point because we haven't been presented with anything. But I will tell you that the only way you're going to climb out of a $2 billion hole is to have a massive property tax increase. You cannot, you know, nickel and dime your way out of a $2 billion hole. Uh, you know, there have been a lot of missteps and lack of preparation uh, getting us to the point that we're at right now. And I think uh, at the end of the day, um, you know, it's going to be a massive property tax increase going forward. And so a lot of things should have been done going into this thing. We, we, we didn't have layoffs early on. We didn't talk to, to the unions early on. We didn't uh, have any type of preparation as far as spending cuts and things like that. And then at the end of the day, you know, last year's budget was overinflated. So projections were off. So this whole budget problem was not only COVID alone. A lot of it was mismanagement and misappropriation. Alderman Spasato, you hear your colleague there saying property tax hikes uh, seem to be inevitable. Do you agree with that? Well, I sure do hope he's wrong. I have the utmost respect for my colleague, Anthony Gill. Um, I don't know. I mean, obviously everything's got to be on the table. Nobody wants to see a property tax. I mean, I'm relying, this is, this is my scariest budget in my, you know, this is my 10th budget and it's really a scary time. Um, you know, we have to look at everything. I have to rely on people way smarter than me, and that's uh, Susie Park and Jenny Bennett to come up with some great ideas. And of this course, is the budget team us, in I'm the sure. mayor's office, the budget and right. finance team. Right, yeah. So I'm sure many aldermen, just like me, I call them, I call Susie every once in a while with some suggestions and some ideas. Um, you know, some are, I'm sure are, that were kind of good ideas and some were probably bad ideas. But, you know, like I say, we have to take a good look at everything. We, we can't leave any stones unturned. So I am glad the LaSalle Street tech is off, is off the table, though. Um, I think that would have been a disaster. But, um, you know, everything's got to be on the table. Take a good hard look at everything. So we'll see what happens. Alderman Very Viegas, scary time. Alderman Viegas uh, you're close with the mayor. You're the mayor's floor leader. Will the mayor propose a property tax hike? She's, she, said, she has said uh, repeatedly that uh, that's a last resort. So everything is on the table. And, you know, this is a, a truly a pandemic that we've we've never seen. When you take a look at the jobs that have lost that have been lost, uh, they're greater than, than than the Great Depression. And so these are these are times that we've been never have never experienced. Uh, and everything's going to be on the table. There's a lot of communications that are ongoing right now uh, with uh, folks in the unions, folks in Springfield. Everyone's everyone's got to make sure that we're all in this together. And those are the discussions that are taking place right now. I'm hearing a lot of vague phrases like everything's on the table and we're all in this together. I think viewers want to know uh, specifics. So Alderman Rosana Rodriguez Sanchez, what about layoffs and furloughs? Can they be avoided at all? And what departments can afford those layoffs and furloughs? I, I would say that that definitely is not something that um, that I would support. Um, I think that last budget, uh, we had lots of different conversations about uh, progressive revenue options that we could bring to the table. One example um, was the pilot uh, program, which is a payment in lieu of fees for institutions like the University of Chicago, for example, that has massive endowments and don't really pay taxes, right? And acquire lots of property around the area and don't pay any property taxes on those. Um, on those. So um, I think that there are things that we still need to be looking at that we need to be proposing. The budget hole is really deep, um, but there are progressive measures that we have proposed and that we should definitely be looking at. Uh, Alderman Anthony Beal, you, you heard the mayor there say that uh, there is some relaxing of restrictions right now. What's the long-term projection here when you still have restaurants and, and businesses that are just not doing anywhere near the businesses that they normally do? Well, um, that's exactly why you saw the first announcement was 1.2 billion for next year. And then that number grew another uh, 50 million seven days later. And so the, the budget deficit is going to be a lot greater than it's even being um, um, proposed right now. I mean, I projected this year alone was going to be between 1.2 and 1.6 billion. And that was, um, you know, post COVID, well, pre COVID, I'm sorry. And, um, and the number was dead on. 
But at the same time, when you look at what we're facing for next year, our pension obligations and things like that, you know, it's going to get a lot worse. And we should have been having furlough days. We should have been cutting spending. We should have been doing a lot of things in preparation of this. But we didn't because we're waiting for the federal government. We're waiting for Springfield to bail us out. And if they do do some type of bailout, they're going to look at it and say, well, what have you done in preparation? And we're going to say absolutely nothing. I mean, to have discussions going on now, we should have had discussions going on in March, I, April, I, I, May. All right, we're going to have to leave it there. I'm sorry, uh, Alderman uh, Rodriguez Sanchez. We'll pick up uh, with you uh, in just a bit uh, later on the program. We'll be joined again by you all later in the program to discuss the mayor's public safety plan and more. But for now, my thanks to Alderman Viegas, Beal, and Spasado, and Alderwoman Rosana Rodriguez Sanchez. Thank you, Thank you Paris. And now, Brandis, we go back to you. Paris, thank you. The former Cook County Hospital building is vacant no more. After sitting empty for nearly two decades, it's been redeveloped for mixed use with hotel rooms, offices, and retail space. Leaders gathered this morning to cut the ribbon and they touted the project as a sign of hope amid an economic downturn. Chicago Tonight's Nick Blumberg reports. A building that was left for dead and gone has been resurrected. Local officials and developers heralded the $140 million renovation of the historic former hospital, an architectural landmark built in 1916 in the Beaux-Arts style. Despite the building's ornate design, it was open to all. Every immigrant, every African American, every Latino, every HIV positive man, woman or child who came through its doors, regardless of ability to pay or citizenship. Many who gathered Tuesday morning were born at the hospital, like Alderman Walter Burnett of the 27th Ward, where the property sits. My mom was 15 and uh, my dad was 20. They didn't have any medical insurance. And if it wasn't for, if it was not for the county hospital and if it was not for public housing, you know, uh, I don't know where I would be. But the building was crumbling after years of neglect. It was replaced by Stroger Hospital in 2002 as the county's main medical facility, and this property came close to the wrecking ball. After narrowly surviving a vote by the county board, the building spent nearly 20 years as an empty but elegant eyesore. Broken windows, a dirty graffiti-covered exterior. It was added to the National Register of Historic Places in 2006 and became a City of Chicago landmark in 2019. A long push by preservationists and county leaders came to fruition when the massive renovation kicked off two years ago. Preserving this building and returning it to the community through an adaptive reuse was not just the right thing to do from a historic perspective. Preserving the old Cook County Hospital made physical sense. That's because the project was funded by private money, along with some historic preservation tax credits. The building now boasts 210 Hyatt hotel rooms, more than 70,000 square feet of medical office space, a food hall, and a museum of the building's history. It's meant to be the anchor of a larger redevelopment effort. The Harrison Square project is eventually intended to bring even more retail and residential space to the Illinois Medical District. In the meantime, leaders hope breathing new life into the historic hospital building, which opened two years before the 1918 flu pandemic, is a step towards Chicago's comeback from COVID-19. These are some very challenging times, especially for the hospitality and event industry. But it's this commitment, it's this vision that is going to be part of the path. Hospitality, meetings, events will be a big, big part of the recovery of our community. It's For Chicago Tonight, I'm Nick Blumberg. Both the hotel, a mix of short-term and extended stay rooms, and the food hall are open now. And now, Paris, we go back to you. Brandis, thank you very much. And still to come on Chicago Tonight, Alderman discussed the mayor's public safety plan as the city approaches 600 homicides this year alone. An update from the Chicago Police Department's Looting Task Force Initiative. Tips on how to deal with COVID-related anxiety in the winter months. And meet an Illinois farmer who collects heirloom apple trees and grows more than 100 varieties. But first, some more of today's top stories. Some Columbia College teachers are conducting outdoor classes today in Grant Park, but it is part of a protest. 
A group of part time faculty members taught outside today saying the school is threatening to lay them off if they don't teach in person classes. The school is allowing 75% of part time faculty to teach remotely, 25% in person. The teachers say they are demanding comprehensive testing and more safety precautions before they return to the classroom. The census deadline is about a week away, although there is still some confusion on that. Illinois Governor Lieutenant Governor Juliana Stratton is trying to boost participation, especially in the city's African-American and Hispanic, Hispanic Latino neighborhoods. Stratton says there could be dire consequences if Chicago and Cook County's self-response numbers don't improve. What is justice if it does not mean having seats at the tables where decisions are being made? What is justice if it does not mean bringing dollars to communities that have been left out and left behind for far too long. Right now, Chicago's self-response rate is about 59 percent. Cook County's response rate is around 65 percent. And I know that in these last days, we can do so much better. Court rulings have demanded the count continue through the end of October, but the U.S. Secretary of Commerce has said it will end on October 5th instead. The White Sox are off to a hot start in their best-of-three playoff series against the Oakland A's. Slugger Jose Abreu hit a two-run homer to center in the third, and it was all the scoring the Sox would need after getting a gem from starting pitcher Lucas Giolito. Final score, White Sox 4, A's 1. And the Cubs open their best of three playoff series with the Miami Marlins tomorrow afternoon. Early in the program, our guests weighed in on the precarious state of the city's finances, and they join us again, this time to share their thoughts on the city's high rate of gun violence and more. And we welcome back Alderman Gilbert Villegas, Nick Spazzato, Anthony Beal, and Alderwoman Rosana Rodriguez-Sanchez. Alderwoman Rodriguez-Sanchez, very quickly, you wanted to push back on the notion of furloughs and cuts to city workers. Well, I, my, my colleague Anthony Beal was uh, talking about austerity and how we should have been making those cuts before. Um, and I wanted to push back against that notion because last budget, we actually proposed several measures that would bring progressive revenue. We talked about corporate head tax. All of those things sort of are brushed away. But after COVID, we realized that there was no safety net, right? Like people were left to their own devices. People, people have been struggling because we don't have anything for them. All right. Uh, so I, I do think that we need to move away from the idea of austerity and really be serious about bringing in progressive revenue, even if that means taxing people who actually can afford right. it. A lot of discussions to come on the budget. You have a few months to hash all this out. To Alderman Spasado, uh, there's renewed talk of, uh, for the Chicago Police Department, a civilian oversight board. Do you think that ordinance uh, has steam right now? Uh, I don't think so. I certainly would hope not. I think it's a terrible idea. Uh, it's not something I would support. Um, civilian appoint people, uh, especially CPAC, uh, you know, $3 million expense that we don't need, elected commissioners and then assistants and so on and so forth. So uh, I, I, I don't think so. I, I certainly would hope not. Um, I like that, you know, the mayor ultimately is going to be responsible. Uh, so it's up to her to pick her superintendent and, um, uh, you know, for, for police and then a the commissioner for the fire department and, uh, you know, have them sort things out. So. Well, one of the things being debated is what kind of power this Civilian Oversight Board uh, should have. Uh, Alderman Viegas, should, should a board like this be able to set policy, for instance, uh, banning no-knock warrants? Well, here, let me just say that as it relates to CPAC and GAPA, you take a look at a lot of the responsibilities associated with those two uh, entities. They mirror the city council, what the responsibilities are of the city council. So I think that if those are the things that uh, city council members want to want to be in charge of then we should go ahead and, and and do it there's nothing prohibiting us from 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 taking those powers via an ordinance um you know to to expand government for an additional uh 22 members along with staff um i would argue that if, if we're going to increase that budget and take away the responsibilities of 40 percent of the budget then then maybe we need to take a look at reducing the the, the size of the city council uh because if you're if you're adding 22 uh, elected officials plus staff and taking 40 percent of the budget then maybe we have too many aldermen i don't know who has the dog uh, there but i'll go to alderman anthony beal you know earlier in the summer you were complaining about the the lack of uh, preparation for uh, the looting that happened and, and the high uh, violence rate that, that's been going on especially the south and west side you wanted the national guard to come in are you satisfied uh, that the cpd has gotten some of this under control 
Well, absolutely not. Um, when you look at what they're doing now, they're taking at least 20 officers per district across the city and they're centralizing them downtown. There's some quality of life things that I've been trying to get taken care of here. And I've talked to my commander and he said he just does not have the resources to do it because our manpower is being distributed downtown to protect downtown. And we understand we want to do that, but at the same time, don't do it at the expense of the communities. And that's the only reason why we're looking to bring the National Guard in, because the National Guard can be doing the same thing those officers are doing downtown, is sitting around just creating a barrier and having a presence downtown. And it would be a lot cheaper if we had the National Guard. And so, you know, everything that happened, there was lack of preparation, or, you know, and the first round of looting, I get it. That caught us all off guard. But the second round of looting, we should have been prepared. We were caught off guard totally twice, um, you know, the second go round. And, you know, the plan didn't come out until three, four weeks later after the second round. And so it was lack of preparation. But we tried to warn the administration. We tried sending the, the, the smoke screens up to the to the sky, letting them know that something was going on. And it was totally uh, ignored. Alderman Spasado, I mean, you're, you're a former firefighter, very pro-police. Uh, do you Once think, a firefighter, always a always firefighter. A firefighter. <laughs> uh, do you think CPD has gotten the, the problem under control? I think they've gotten under control. We certainly uh, lost big time the first time. We could have done a little bit better the second time. But I, I think we figured things out pretty well now. I met with the superintendent not that long ago. You know, had some good conversations with him. Of course, we didn't agree on a lot of things. But, uh, yeah, I, I think the city's got it a lot more under control now. Unfortunately, uh, I only represent one uh the police district and you know we're just getting hammered with our resources were very thin as it was and and to take 10 percent of our resources away that you know it, i don't that doesn't bode well with me but i'm always trying to talk to the uh, superintendent and, and the first deputy and the chief of patrol always looking for more ways to protect our community and i, I obviously i talked to my commander you know five days a week so all right, we're going to have to leave it there. My thanks again to Alderman Beal, Viegas, and Spasado, and Alderwoman Rosana Rodriguez Sanchez. Okay. Thank you all so much. Harris, Harris, that's the office dog for the record. That's the office dog. Okay. <laughs> You're the guy. That's the right, watchdog. The, huh? the dog, the watchdog, wanted to weigh in there. All right, Brandis, we go back to you. Paris, thank you. The Chicago Police Department says it's made progress identifying and arresting looters from the August 10th incidents, but. Police Superintendent David Brown says there's still more work that needs to be done. Each window and door that was broken that night left our city wounded. Our collective sense of safety was shattered by the actions of the looters, thieves, and vandals that you see on this video. Joining us with an update on the looting task force is WTTW News reporter Matt Masterson. And Matt, we just heard Superintendent Brown uh, refer to uh, video. Remind us the purpose of the, the looting task force and the video that he's referring to. So this video that was released earlier this week, it's 47 minutes of surveillance footage from 80 separate incidents back on August 10th uh, when there was some widespread looting in the city. Now this uh, looting task force was launched just after that and it's essentially a group of Chicago police detectives who are focusing solely on that, uh, reviewing that footage and photos from that night on August 10th um, and trying to figure out uh, who the suspects are, identifying them and arresting them. Uh, since it's launched, police officials say they've received more than 400 tips from the public uh, and they've made 74 felony arrests relating to the burglaries and that looting. And they're still seeking information on about 80 or so other uh, suspects related to that day. Now, Superintendent Brown says that it's not up to the CPD to quote tip the <clears throat> scales one way, but he says he would like to see more jail time. CPD have any influence over jail time for arrested suspects? They can make suggestions, but not exactly. It's the state's attorney's office that approves its charges, and it's uh, the judges who decide the sentences. But Brown says he has been pushing for more strict sentences for those convicted in these looting and robbery cases. Brown has done similar things this year, uh, calling for longer sentences for gun offenders amid the ongoing spike in violent crime this year in Chicago as well. Okay, and WTTW News reporter Matt Masterson, thanks as always. Thank you. And you can read Matt's full story on our website. That's WTTW.com slash news. And now, Paris, we go back to you. Thanks, Brandis. And please stay with us. Up next, minding your mental health during COVID-19. But first, we want to take just a few minutes to ask you to become a member of WTTW. Your membership makes commercial-free public media possible. So whether you're watching Chicago Tonight, The News Hour, Washington Week, or our new shows, Chicago Tonight, Black Voices or Latino Voices, 
Our goal is to always keep you informed with fair and even-handed news. And our fundraising efforts are critical to the news coverage we provide because the work we do isn't possible without your contribution. So please call 773-588-1111 or go online to WTTW.com and pledge your financial support. Here's how you can help. Now more than ever, fact-based news coverage is vital to our Chicago community. If you haven't already joined the WTTW family, now's the time to make an impact with your financial support. With your ongoing gift of just $5 a month or a one-time contribution of $60, you'll get access to Passport, an exclusive streaming service for members that lets you watch thousands of your favorite WTTW and PBS programs. Call 773-588-1111 or go online to WTTW com to become a member and unlock passport right now thank you and as we mentioned earlier in the show the first presidential debate is tonight the decisions that voters make in november locally and nationally will reverberate across our communities for a generation to come that's why we put a high priority on what's happening in politics during an election year and in fact it's why we devote so much of our coverage to politics and politicians every year that's because high quality news coverage has a robust and positive effect on political participation we also put a high priority on fair balanced reporting and keeping an eye on the people and institutions that we have entrusted to protect our well-being Local news, like the fact-based journalism you find here at Chicago Tonight, encourages public awareness, scrutiny, and debate. And that civic participation, which is fostered by local news, the kind you watch here every night, compels our public institutions to work better while creating stronger communities. But this sort of community engagement can only happen with your help. Running a strong newsroom takes financial resources. That's why we're asking for your support to help keep this essential public service strong now and into the future. It doesn't take much to make a difference, but it does take the help of everyone who values what we provide here at Chicago Tonight and WTTW News. You can make a contribution by calling the 773-588-1111 or going online to WTTW.com to donate. Thank you. And now Brandis, back to you and how to combat, combat stress during the pandemic. Paris, thank you. The COVID-19 pandemic presents a new pandemic in itself of increased stress, anxiety, and depression for many people. With the weather already starting to cool down, seasonal depression could be another problem facing Chicagoans. Joining us to share advice on how to get through this winter is Inger Burnett Ziegler, Associate Professor of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. Thank you so much for joining us. So, you joined us uh, back in March at the beginning of the pandemic. Describe the impact that you've seen this pandemic take on your clients' uh, mental health. Yeah, it's really brought on a global stress and anxiety for many of the people that I'm working with. Um, they're experiencing stress related to their routines being altered, stress related to trying to manage the multiple responsibilities that they have in front of them, including but not limited to working from home, taking care of kids, trying to adjust to the new way of doing things that they would be getting done in the past, um, and also a lot of uncertainty about how things are going to be in the future. And so that uncertainty really prevents people from being able to plan in a way that they would typically do. Um, and that, that planning often gives people a lot of comfort. Uh, what, um, what impact would you say the pandemic has had, uh, especially on the mental health of essential workers? Yeah, essential workers are people that are putting their lives at risk, um, often out of necessity. So there's the stress that comes from their own personal health care, the stress that comes from the health uh, risk that they might be exposing their family members to. Um, and so that really um, presents with a, a heightened level of worry about carrying out day to day activities. And so what concerns do you have then about, you know, the typical seasonal depression colliding with the existing pandemic related depression and anxiety that people are already experiencing? Yeah, winter can be a difficult time for people in normal circumstances. 
as the weather changes, as the number of hours of daylight get reduced, people are often um, find themselves withdrawing and isolating more and becoming more sedentary. And when you combine that typical kind of sadness or feelings of being blue that can come with the winter time with the uh, stress related to the pandemic that people have been experiencing for the last six months, a lot of folks are really in a vulnerable, pos vulnerable position. They've already been experiencing the isolation from friends and family. They've already been experiencing the disruption in their daily routines and combining that with some sadness that can generally come with winter time can be particularly challenging. How do you recommend combating sort of that isolation um, and the depression and anxiety that can come with them uh, as we head into the winter months? I think sometimes the urge for folks can be to say, hey, it's gonna be winter. I'm just gonna, you know, settle into myself, withdraw from folks and, and let this time of year pass. Um, this year, because we've been dealing with this for so long, I really recommend that people be proactive. I suggest that people proactively find opportunities to connect with friends and loved ones, find opportunities to stay active, even if that activity means um, doing so in a virtual way. Um, and really uh, being intentional about taking advantage of the sunlight while we have it. Um, here at our center at Northwestern, uh, we really promote the use of uh, light boxes. And so that might not be something that people may have considered in the past, but it might be something worth considering this year. And the winter is a long time, so you might want to start soon. Especially in Chicago. Especially in Chicago. Um, if cases do rise and uh, if there is another stay at home order, how do you recommend uh, folks stay calm about that and, and sort of maintain a bit of mental health stability? You know, something that I tell myself and I tell the clients that I work with is to take one day at a time and control the things that are available to you and let go of the things that are out of your control. And so if there's an extension, although that, uh, or excuse me, if the order is uh, expanded, um, you know, while that will be disappointing and uh, difficult for a lot of people to reckon with, um, you know, I really think we should just think about what we can do with that situation um, and plan within those confines. Of course, and, and with the holidays coming up, some folks may be uh, remembering folks that they've lost um, and holidays reminding them of that. And hopefully that's something that we can have you back on as we get closer to the holidays to discuss because we are actually out of time. Uh, but my thanks to Inger Burnett Ziegler for joining us. Thanks so much. Thank you. And up next, we introduce you to an Illinois farmer who collects heirloom apple trees. But first, a look at the weather. Lots of people collect things, art records, or art records, baseball cards, but chances are you've never met anyone who collects trees. A while back, about this time of year, Jay Shevsky visited a man with a collection of heirloom apple trees. Here's another look at that story. I'm Al Westerman, and I'd like to welcome you to our family farm that uh, my grandparents, uh, Wilhelm and Bertha Westerman, purchased back in 1911. And along with it came, you know, the old homestead house, and then there was a barn and an apple orchard. In those days, Al says, every homestead in the area had an apple orchard. But over the years, what has happened, all these family uh, orchards are gone. When he finished college in the mid-70s, his father was ready to retire from farming. And Al had an idea. I wanted to establish an orchard that would reflect what it was like back around 1900 era. So then I went out searching for uh, apple trees. Al has made it his mission to find and save old trees and bring them here. So for the last 40 years, I've been driving all around looking for these old orchards and uh, sometimes I have to go through brush and everything else to try to find them or there may be just one tree left in the backyard. And uh, so I asked the people there and they were always very willing. Sure, you can take a cutting. They're, they thought that was interesting. 
So far, Al has collected 124 types of apples. They have names like Hubberston Nunsuch, Pixie Crunch, Ashmead's Kernel, and my favorite, Westfield Seek No Further. Some of them I've never been able to identify. I'd even sent them off to some of the experts, and they weren't identif- be able to identify them. He's studied old fruit catalogs, even bought known heirloom varieties to try and match his unknown apples. And uh, over the years now, I have uh, probably over 100 named varieties, and I have probably about two dozen unnamed varieties. So I'm still looking for those names on there. This apple here was my grandmother's favorite apple. This is called a Northwest Green. This is a King Luscious. It dates back to about 1930s. This uh, tree here is a Nova Spy. This is called Esopus Spitzenbergus. This is a Detroit red apple. This is a winter banana. Don't ask me how they got the name winter banana. Okay, this is my favorite tree of all. It's called the King David. When you eat the apple, just like having wine in your mouth. It's just fantastic. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, and the flavor stays with wow. you. It doesn't just, it just kind of just stays in your mouth. It's just unbelievable. I'll take three bushels. <laughs> <laughs> but before I get your hopes up too much, I have to tell you that Al Westerman does not sell any of his apples. Al and his wife Diana keep some for themselves. Friends and family get what they want, and the rest he gives to food pantries, even the King David's. So why can't I buy this in a store? Uh, primarily because of the, it's not a good keeper. Oh. It doesn't store very well or ship very well. Now here's one thing I never knew, and I bet you didn't either. If you want to grow a King David or any variety, you have to graft a cutting of that variety onto an existing tree. Why? Well, that's the only way that you can get that variety. Wait, so if I took the seeds out of this apple and planted them? You won't get. For example, that was a King David you're eating. Right. Take those seeds from a King David, you plant them, you're not going to get a King David. You're going to get a mixed apple, you don't even know what you're going to get, in fact. I'm still mystified by this, frankly, but suffice it to say that every apple in this orchard began like this, by grafting a cutting onto a tree. You can even graft multiple varieties onto a single tree. Okay, this is one of my trees that uh, has been called a Frankenstein tree, because it has at least uh, 10 to 12 different varieties on one tree. What? Wait, wait, wait. Al teaches grafting, it turns out, and over the years, this has become his teaching tree. This is the, the original Golden Delicious. And it includes and an apple real. I've heard of. And I just want you to take a look at that and see how that is different than what the Golden it's Delicious It's completely are different. It doesn't look perfect, and it has flavor. Wow. That is not like any Golden Delicious apple I've ever had. That's fantastic. For Al Westerman, this apple orchard is not only about saving old apple varieties, it's also become a way to feed his community, pass on his knowledge of trees, and honor his parents and grandparents. For Chicago Tonight, this is Jay Shevsky. Okay, so I've got, what, 123 more varieties to taste? Yeah. Okay. (laughs) How do you like them apples, Jay? Al Westerman, by the way, has a significant tree resume. He has a master's degree in forest pathology. He was a naturalist with the Lake County Forest Preserve and later its president. And for years, he ran a tree nursery business on his farm. On our website, you can see the full list of Al's apple varieties, but not his address. Remember, his apples are not for sale. And that is our show for this Tuesday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, wttw.com slash news. Man knows his apples, Paris. And you can also get the show via podcast and the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night live at 7. Highlights from the first presidential debate between Donald Trump and Joe Biden. And a look at Mayor Lightfoot's new public safety plan. And stay tuned now for special news hour coverage of tonight's presidential debate. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Paris Schutz. And I'm Brandis Friedman. Thank you for watching. Stay safe and healthy and have a good night.
Closed captioning for this program is brought to you by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, dedicated to preserving the dignity and rights of all individuals.